enduring forever. Yes, it does, God. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, who you are. We worship you. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, who you are. You are good.
to stop singing. Every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. Every knee we will bow to the risen King. Lift Him up, lift Him up. Never gonna stop singing. Oh, never gonna stop. Every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. Every God, we worship you for who you are. Amazing God. Such a beautiful name. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden.
worship. Well, we usually share a because it's worth it moment with you all. I'm so glad that you were able to come and come to service tonight. Do any of you remember the first time you were ever baptized? That was a pretty special time, wasn't it? And I'm sure you had people that were cheering you on and rooting for you and just happy for what God was doing in that moment of you becoming more like Jesus. Well, some wonderful things have been happening here with baptismals. We have had about 40 guys from Crossroads get baptized here at Pure Heart. And 
The year is not even over yet, and we've had more baptismals this year in Pure Heart all together than we had last year. That is awesome. God is doing some awesome things here, and I just want to ask tonight, we're doing baptismals, and it would be awesome if you all can stay, if time permits, to cheer these people on that are saying, have already said yes to Jesus and taken that next step so that they can have that new life in him. Ushers, can you come forward so that we can receive the offering? Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to come into your house, Lord, to be able to come into your presence and to be able to give with such cheerful hearts to the things that matter to you, Lord. Lord, we pray, Father God, that as we give, Lord, generously, as we give cheerfully, Lord, that these offerings, Father God, would be put to good use for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord. And we thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Church. If you are new, please fill out the guest card attached to your bulletin and bring it to the information center in the lobby. We would love to connect with you and help you explore the exciting things available to you and your family. Pure Heart is a place where you are encouraged to come authentically as you are, experience healing and growth, and discover meaning and purpose through relationship with Jesus Christ. Pure Heart is a family of Christ followers committed to making disciples who love God and love others. We connect with God through worship, salvation, baptism, and communion. We want to help you grow with others in the family of God through personal, relational, and intentional discipleship. This happens through discipleship coaching, life together groups, classes, and healing and support ministries. We are a community that values transparency, vulnerability, and relationships. In our shared connection and love for Christ, we go out into the greater community and the world to make real change. Will you join us? At Pure Heart, we desire to see children and students develop lifelong faith through connecting in small groups, partnering with parents, and giving opportunities to serve others. To get connected, please stop by the information center in the lobby or visit us online at pureheart.org. Well, I want to share about two events that we have coming up here at Pure Heart over the next two weeks. The first one is School of Prayer. It's taking place on September 23rd. It starts at about 8.30 in the morning, and child care will be provided, and it goes until about 12.30. I think this School of Prayer is a big deal because we can never have this whole prayer thing down packed. I don't know about you guys, but I know that I could always use some tools to help me be able to have a more effective prayer life and to just learn how to apply God's word to areas in my life. Um, I went to a school of prayer a couple years ago and I was just like, I don't know what this is gonna be like. This is gonna be weird. I don't know a lot of the people here, but I was pleasantly surprised when I went. When I went, we had, there were teachers there and they are so enthusiastic and just really sharing the wisdom that they've learned over the years because none of us have this all figured out. So I would invite you all to sign up if you haven't already signed up, just go to pureheart.org and click on the banner for School of Prayer. And then we have another event, PH Community Love Our Schools Day is coming up the week after on the 30th. And we really wanna support our schools in the community. Like we are doing everything that we can to become more like Jesus for the sake of others. And part of doing that is reaching out to our community, reaching out to our schools. There are several projects that you can sign up for so that you can um, just help out to bless a school, clean up, paint. There are even opportunities to pray if you wanna pray for a school. So I just welcome you to sign up for those two opportunities and you all enjoy your service. Well, good evening, Pure Heart. How you doing tonight? You doing good? It is so good to see you. Welcome to week two of our series, Which Way? And I want to welcome everybody online. Give our online family a big hand tonight. Thank you for joining us. 
especially Crossroads Recovery family. We love you guys. And some of you guys are here tonight to be baptized. You excited about that? Come on now. I love it. I love it. Well, here we go. Week two of which way? Now, we all have ways in life to deal with stress. Can I get a mm-hmm from anybody? We all have ways to cope with the stress that comes our way. The problem is we don't often pick Jesus' way to deal with the stress of life. The stress hits and we need comfort, so we escape into shopping. We escape into more spending. We escape into all kinds of destructive patterns and behaviors. Sometimes we even escape into food. I hear people that deal with that. So sorry about that. You know, it's just a rough thing to deal with, all right? Did you guys know that what stressed spelled backwards is? Anybody know stressed spelled backwards? Let me just show you right now. This is an epiphany for some people right here. Just turn to your neighbor and go, that's all I needed tonight. That's all I just... I just need to know why I got the issues that I do, all right? Last week we discovered that Jesus made faith personal. And how many realize when life becomes personal, things begin to change? Can I get a yes from you tonight? Jesus made faith personal. He leaned into his disciples in the upper room and he said to them, I'm about to die, I'm about to go to the cross, I'm about to lay down my life, I'm leaving, and where I'm going right now, you can't come with me. They were overwhelmed, and Thomas is the only one that asked the question. He's like, where are you going? We don't know the way to where you're going. And Jesus leaned in and he said these words and it changed everything. It changed my life, changed your life. It's the very reason we sit here in this church tonight. Jesus said this personal statement, I am the way. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life is what Jesus said. And we often see faith or religion as a lot of people like to say it. We see it as a system of rules to live by, mostly the do not rules, all right? I grew up in church. How many of you grew up in church? Anybody raise your hand? How many of you never, never been to church until you started coming to Pure Heart? Anybody just raise your hand high? I love that. Come on, give them a hand. We're glad about that. All right? But I grew up in church, and every denomination I was in had some kind of rules, some kind of guidelines, some kind of traditions you had to live by. Man, you don't know how. Okay. All right. You Baptists, and you had rules, and Pentecostals, both hands in the air. All right? Yeah, and you had rules, too, and Methodists, and Mainline. Yeah, can we be honest? We didn't think you had enough rules, okay? You, like, you guys needed more rules. And then how about Catholic? Any Catholics out there? Yeah? Yeah, you, you, mostly guilt. You dealt with that. But the good news is you could go and confess that and just get rid of all of it. Like you go out, fill your sin bucket up, then bring it in, dump it out, you know? And we were kind of jealous, like, how does that work, man? That's, that's kind of cool, okay? Because of these rules, we became really good at monitoring or modifying our behavior. It started when we were kids. Remember as kids, you know, you got in trouble. Anybody got in trouble as a kid? All right, come on. some of you wouldn't raise your hand no matter what I said, okay? All right, and our parents had methods to move us to behavior change, didn't they? Did your mom and dad have some methods that moved you to change and modify your behavior? Anybody? I know we can't talk about them now, can we? It's like, but you know what I'm talking about. It was like, I will change, okay. I'm going to change. Everything's going to be all right. And then we went to school, and your teacher had rules, and then maybe college, and they had rules. And then you started working, and there were rules in the workplace that we don't do that here. We do it this way here. And so you modified your behavior, and then you got married. And there are rules you didn't even know about. And she had rules, and he has rules, and his family did things differently than your family did them. And so you had to change your behavior. And all throughout life, we discovered that to be successful, you need to modify your ways. Can I get a yes on that tonight? To be successful, you realize, I've got to change my ways. I've got to modify my ways. But then, no matter how good you tried to be, no matter how good you tried to live out all the rules and do all the things right and behave as best you can, there always came that moment when you said something you wish you wouldn't have said. Anybody? Maybe that happened to you today. Maybe like an hour ago, okay? <laughs> you did something you wish you never would have done. And when you did that thing and you said that thing, what is it that often came into your mind? Maybe right out of your mouth. What did you simply say or what did you simply think? You thought to yourself, where did that come from? I mean, I thought I had that all buttoned down and dealt with. I, I thought I had changed. I thought I had all of those things worked out. Where in the world did that come from? You got mad and boom, here it comes, Mr. Nasty. And you just flew out of your mouth, didn't it? And you said to yourself, where did that come from? And Solomon, the wise man Solomon, knows exactly where that comes from. And this is what he says in the book of Proverbs. Solomon writes all kinds of wonderful things. He writes Proverbs and Song of Songs, which is really beautiful, okay? Ecclesiastes, which is a little bit depressing. 
I think Solomon wrote that when he was about 40. He was having a middle age crisis, okay? And then you have the Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, Solomon leans into something. He talks about all kinds of stuff, the righteous and the unrighteous and how to raise your kids and how to honor your folks and all these kind of things. And then all of a sudden, Solomon says, let me just boil it all down. Like, I like the music there with the phone. That's good. <laughs> It's pretty good, wasn't it? I thought that was in the plan right there, but it wasn't. Turn it off. Okay, so Solomon says this. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. This is what Solomon says. Above all else. Let's just say that together. Ready? Go. Above all else. It's like, okay, Solomon, above all else what? What, what is it that should be above all else? And this is what he says. Guard your what? Now, now, Solomon, why is it so paramount that I guard my heart? And this is what Solomon says. You want to know where it comes from? You want to know where those words, you want to know where those actions, you want to know where all that stuff that you go, man, where did that come from? How did I do that? You want to know where it comes from? And this is what Solomon says. For everything you do flows from it. Everything we do flows from our heart. It all comes from within. What if that was true? What if it's true that everything that we did originates from within us? One day Jesus is walking along and there's this huge crowd that's following him and some religious leaders show up from Jerusalem and they make their way through the crowd. Go with me to Matthew chapter 15 real quick in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 15. Tonight. Open your Bible app. Go to Matthew chapter 15. Take one of those Bibles out of the backs of the chair in front of you. If you're on the front row, reach around and have someone help you. But get a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 15. It's the very beginning of the New Testament. First book in the New Testament. Go about two-thirds of the way through that book and you will find Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to be in verse 2 in just a moment. Jesus is walking along. There's this huge crowd that's following him. And these, le these religious leaders from Jerusalem make their way through the crowd to ask Jesus a question. They want to trick him. They want to catch him. They want to trap him. And they say to him, this question, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 2. By the fact, if you don't own a Bible and you took one out of the backs of the chairs, that's yours. You keep it. It's free. Leave the pen, but take the Bible. All right. <laughs> I'm going broke on those pens. All right. So this is what the religious leaders ask, okay? Matthew 15, 2. Why do your disciples, says one of the religious leaders, why do your disciples break the, say it with me, the tradition of the elders, they don't wash their hands before they eat. Disgusting. How many can see your grandpa, your grandma, your mom and dad right now? Wash your hands before you eat. Why do they break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus kind of smiles and he looks at them and he has a little bit of a rebuttal. He says this, he goes on, verse 3. Jesus replied, and why do you break the... He like raises the, raises the stakes, doesn't he? Oh, we break one of your traditions, but why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? He's like, you actually break a command of God to support one of your traditions. It'd be kind of like this. It'd be like a father saying to their teenage daughter, I don't want you to talk disrespectfully to your mother anymore. Just, just dream about this, okay? And the daughter says, okay, fine. I will make up a rule to keep myself, I will make up a new tradition to keep myself from breaking a command to honor my father and my mother. And the teenage daughter looks at her, looks at her dad and says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to talk to mom at all. I'm just not going to talk to her anymore. To which if you're the parent, you're going, no, 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 no. You just made up a rule that breaks a rule. To honor your mother, to honor your mother. You need to respond when your mom talks to you. Oh, no. No, I'm going to make up a tradition. I'm going to make up a rule to just, so I don't break that rule, Dad. He goes on. Religious leaders had this rule because they didn't want to follow one of God's rules. And in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 4, Jesus continues, and here's what happened. He says, For God said, Honor your father and mother, but you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. See, they had this rule that you could verbally declare. Now, check this out. You could verbally declare, Everything I own, everything I have is dedicated to Yahweh, is dedicated to God. The cool part about this tradition they made up is you could still use everything while you were still alive. Now get your mind around this. Somebody comes to you and asks you for some help. You're like, I'm sorry, 
Sorry, I have dedicated all of it to God already. It was an incredibly crafty way to not be generous. Your father and mother come and ask you for help. They go, no, 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 no. There's no giving while I'm living. <laughs> Just write that. If you're taking notes, you write that down, okay? No, no, no. There's no giving while I'm living. I've dedicated everything to God. I found a loophole at the temple, and I don't have to be generous anymore. Now, Jesus is not having any of this. Matter of fact, he's a little ticked off. Righteously. Here's what he says. Thus you nullify, everybody say nullify. You nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And then he says this, you, say it with me, hypocrites. And when Jesus drops that bomb on, hypocrite bomb, what he's saying is, end of discussion. There'll be no more discussion about it. That is hypocritical. You made a tradition to avoid a command, so shutty de mouthy. It's somewhere in the Greek, I'm sure, all right. So the people cheer, you know, come on, let's just cheer right now. The people cheer like, woo, you know. The, re the religious leaders kind of sneak back into the crowd a little bit, you know. And they're you can imagine they're talking to each other like, who came up with that question? Jerry, Jerry, was that you? Jerry always has bad questions. No more questions for Jerry for Jesus, all right? That's not in the Bible. I made it up. All right. Now Jesus doesn't want the crowd to miss the point. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10, that's what he says. Listen, Matthew chapter, yes, here we go. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. He's like, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. He's like, stay with me, okay? He goes on. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. That's what actually defiles them. And now so a little time goes on, it's just Jesus and his guys, and they're like, hey, we just want you to know, if you, I want you to read through Matthew chapter 15 this week. We just want you to know, the religious leaders, like they were really, really, really upset. And Jesus kind of goes a little bit Italian, and he's like, forget about it, you know, just let them go, who cares, let's just move on. And then Peter goes, he goes, hey, Jesus, could you go over that part again about the whole mouth thing and the body thing and all that and what defiles you? Could you go over that again? Because, like, I mean, I understand it, Jesus, but these guys, they, they need a recap, you know. I mean, I understand, but could you slow down and just kind of explain it a little bit to them? And so here's what Jesus does. He goes, oh, okay, okay. And I think he's kind of having fun. All right, it's a tough statement. He goes, are you still so dull? It's kind of intense, isn't it? And, and this is one of those moments, again, I, I, I say this almost every week. I, I would love to see how this went down. Like, he did, how did he turn around? What, how did he say it? What, how did he express it? He's like, hey, come on, guys. Jesus asked him, and so he goes on. Here's what he says next. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? He's like, let me, let me break this down for you. No pun intended, okay? <laughs> Let's just simplify this whole thing. Goes in the mouthy, travels around, comes out. Everybody got the picture? Do I need to explain it anymore? All right. And, and can you imagine the guys going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think I understand that. All right. And so then he goes on. This is what he says. But the things that come out of a person's mouth, oh, here it is. Here it is, right? Come from the heart, and these defile them. Now watch this. Those, those of you who always want deep stuff, now watch this. Watch verse 19. Are you ready? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. You're like, wait, those aren't words. Those are, those are actions. Wait. Those, are, those aren't words. Those are actually, you do something. That's evil thoughts. Okay, that's inside. But murder, that, that's an action. Adultery, that's an action. Sexual immorality, still in action. Theft, that's an action. False testimony, yeah, that's words. Slander, that's words again. You're mixing actions with words. To which Jesus would say to us, exactly. Because everything, everything originates in the heart. And we need to know this today. Jesus is more concerned about the way of our hearts than anything else. Do you know why this is? Because our hearts will determine which way we will go. Can I get a yes from anybody tonight? 
Our hearts will determine which way we will go. I mean, you know this, don't you? We've all known someone who blew up a job or blew up a marriage or blew up a family because of what came out of their mouth, was lived out from their life. And so I want to give you tonight a way to do a heart check a way to be aware, and we're not very good at this as human beings, a way to be aware at the, at the internal tensions that dwell inside of us. How many are excited about that tonight? Eight of you. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. I want to look at four emotions, and I'm going to talk about these four emotions as we wrap up this part two of this series tonight. Four emotions. These are kind of warning lights on the, on the dashboard of our heart. These four things are simply this. Here's what you need to see tonight. Here's what we're going to look at. Four things. Guilt. Anger, greed, and jealousy. Doesn't that sound like fun? Let's just say them together, all right? Ready, go. Guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. When you have this internal tension, you need to begin to pay attention, all right? When you start to feel guilt, when you start to see, see anger, when you start to feel greed, when you start to feel jealousy, you got to pay attention because something is wrong in your heart. Let's go a little deeper on this. What are some of the, these emotions? What are these emotions saying inside of our heart? Well, guilt is simply saying this. Guilt says, I owe you. Guilt's like, I, I hurt you. I, I broke something. I broke you. I did something wrong. I hurt you, so I owe you. Now I put up walls because I feel defensive about that. And I, now I'm going to keep secrets because I, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to hurt you anymore. And, and, and in your marriages, you're like, you know, you're like well, what's wrong? And like, nothing. What's wrong? Nothing. What's wrong? Nothing. And like, well, how much longer are we going to do this? The rest of our marriage? Nothing. I know, it's not that funny. I don't want to tell you because I'm carrying something. So we become passive aggressive and all this stuff starts swirling around inside of us. I owe you. So now I feel guilty about that. And anger says this. Anger simply says, anger says, you owe me. I don't owe you. You owe me. You hurt me. You broke my heart. You took something from me and you are going to pay me back or I'll pay you back. And here's the problem with anger. We all know this. Anger leaks. It's fluid. And it leaks into all of our relationships, and it leaks everywhere that we go. It leaks into everything that we do. Anger is never isolated. Check this out. Anger is never isolated to the relationship of origin. Anger is never isolated to the one who actually hurt us first. When not dealt with it, it will leak into everything else. You got hurt as a kid. You got hurt in your last job. You got hurt in that last relationship or in that marriage. And now it's leaking everywhere that you go. I remember when I saw this in my life, really for the first time, when I really, really saw that, you know, I thought, you know, I'm such a nice guy and I forgive people. I let things go. And, and then I went through a divorce. And then my first wife, she, she took off with another man, and my heart was absolutely broken. And then God brought this amazing woman, Nicole, into my life. And I talk about this a lot. God brought Nicole into my life. He blessed me with her. And when everything's going great, I mean, I had read and I studied. I did all these things. I wanted to be a great husband. I wanted to be a perfect husband, which is not possible. Just ask Nicole, okay? Don't ask her, Okay. So I wanted, to, I wanted to have it all down. I wanted to deal with all my stuff in the past. I wanted to be ready. But I didn't realize there was still some stuff rumbling around in my heart. And I'll never forget, we had been married about five months. And she went to a Christmas pageant at church with two girls from church. She came home 35 minutes late. Yeah, uh-oh. All right. She walked in the door, and I met her at the door, and I had a few questions. And my wife looked at me. We'd been married five months. This is what she said to me. Okay, I'm German. I'm a little more reserved, a little more laid back, okay? Okay? She looked at me, she goes, why are you yelling at me? And all of a sudden, I stepped outside of myself and looked at how I was acting, and I went, oh my goodness. Ding, 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 ding. I've got an issue in my heart. It's nothing that she's done. It's just her behavior of being 35 minutes late triggered all the brokenness and mistrust when my first wife was another man and coming home an hour, two hours, sometimes a whole day late. And all that stuff I had gone through before got triggered in that moment and I was making her pay for what happened then. It never stays with a relationship of origin. That's why for some of you who've gone through brokenness in relationships, you need to find healing before you move on. Way too quickly we move into the next relationship, we move into the next marriage and that's why second marriages end quicker than first marriages. And third marriage is even faster than that and it just keeps going and going and going because we never deal with the stuff that's inside of our hearts. 
Anger just simply says, you owe me and I'm going to hold it over you and I'm going to hold it over anyone who reminds me of you or reminds me of what you did to me. And long after you're out of my life, I'm going to hold people hostage to what you took from me. Mm. Can I get a mm mm-hmm from anybody in the room tonight? Man, we've been there in our lives. The third one, greed. Greed simply says this. Greed says, I owe me. I mean, I, I deserve to bless me. Okay, I'm going to take care of myself. I owe me. Greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. And I know there's a lot of hurting people, and I know there's a lot of needs in the world. My heart goes out to them, but my money and my time does not. And I know people are struggling. I know people are hurting, but you know what? I feel bad about that, but not bad enough to do anything about it. Because I don't have what I want, so you're not going to get what you need. This is something we say. I don't, so I won't. Can we say that together? I don't, so I won't. I don't have everything I think I need. I don't have everything I need. I think I want. So I don't, so I won't be a blessing to other people. You know, you can be poor and still be greedy. You can have what would be a definition of, of being in poverty and still be greedy. Greed is no respecter of income. Because greed basically just says, it's all for my consumption. No matter how little you have. No, no, no. It's all for my consumption. And greed becomes a filter that we live with. Dads, can I just be real with you for a second? Sometimes our kids feel, our families feel like our stuff is more important to us than they are. That our boat is more important. Our truck is more important. And they feel that from us. They, they feel that from They know because of the way we react to things versus to them. Moms, you know, you've got everything buttoned down, don't you? You've got those few treasures, the ones that haven't been broken yet. you got them, right? You have bubble wrapped them. You have put them away. And when they get near them, you're like, no, no, no. No, touch it. All right. Now, can we, should we have some nice things? Should we protect some nice things? There's a, there's a place for that. But you know when it goes over the edge. You know when those things are more important than your kids or your grandkids. Can I get an amen from the grandparents in the room? Okay, and the grandparents, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, and your parents, you're thinking, I just want to leave something nice behind. One nice thing I want to leave behind for them. Here's the problem. They're going to sell it when you die. No, they're going to sell it. And they're not going to get a good price for it. You know why? Because they don't care. It's just a bad memory to them. Somebody say, Jesus, what happened? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a bad memory to them. They're going to sell it when you're gone. And they're, they're not going to care. Because in their mind, in their mind, they felt like you cared more about that than you did them. They just want to get rid of it as fast as they can get that bad memory out of there. Greed. Oh, the last one. We're having so much fun, aren't we? Are we having fun? Good. All right. Let's do one more. This is the best one. Jealousy. Jealousy says life owes me. And if we're going to really dig deep on this one, in some ways, we're going to be real honest, we feel like God owes me. Like, like he's blessed them, he's blessed her, he's blessed him. But why didn't I get what I wanted? Why didn't I get what I felt like I needed? Life owes me. God, you owe me. You got what I deserved. She got who I deserved. He got my promotion. Now you don't like them anymore. And now it's almost impossible for you to be nice to them. And you know how you know when you're dealing with this? You're going to love this. You know how you know when you're dealing with this? When you secretly celebrate when someone else, is, someone else has a loss or failure. You know you're dealing with it when someone else fails in the very area you want to win at, and you and your heart go, party! It's like a New Year's Eve ball drop, man. You're just like, you got hats and blower things, and you are so excited. I've heard that some guys deal with this. Okay? Your kid's having a bad basketball game. He gets taken out of the game and they put another kid in his spot. And that kid misses five shots in a row. And inside you're like, yeah. I just hear that guys deal with that. I remember the first time that happened to me. And I love this kid that, that was put in the game for my son. He missed like three three free three pointers in a row and inside I was like Phew, that's good and I went "Ooh, that is so bad 
That just stinks to high heaven. Singles, come on now. You're Mr. Right when all wrong. So you secretly enjoy it when your friend finds their Mr. Wrong. Teens in the room tonight, any young people here tonight? Yeah, I see it. Yeah, good to see you. All right, that's good. You know who she is, don't you? Yeah. Her hair is always on point, isn't it? I mean, no, she's got the best hair in the world, the best hair in the whole school. And every day you see her, just like, I hate you. It's, you think that in your mind. You wouldn't say it out loud, but inside you're going, you drive me nuts. And her hair is on point, and it's so exciting. All of a sudden, one day she shows up, and her hair's not on point. And you're, in your mind, you're going, in your mind, you're going, someone ran out of product. <laughs> quick, quick, can I take a picture of you? You get so excited, don't you? So when you feel it, when you see it, you have to deal with it. And so for the last 15 minutes I have left in the service, I'm going to give you four suggestions that are anchored in the Word of God of how you can take a step forward on this way of seeing your heart set free. You excited about that tonight? All right. Let's stand and greet 18 people and say, man, this is good for you tonight. Okay, family, here we go. Open up your bulletin notes if you want to. You can write some things down, get out your phones, go to your notes. I want to give you a few steps, the four steps that you can take. And I'm going to promise you right up front, okay, as we dive into this, some of this is not going to make any sense to you emotionally. Matter of fact, when I, when I share these things, some of you will just be like, I don't want to do that. Now, some of you will say, I, I can't do that. You don't understand what I've been through. And I know all that. But remember what we talked about last week? Some of you weren't here last week. What we talked about last week is there's always a cost at some point in following Jesus. But if we don't pay that price up, for, up front, there's a huge balloon payoff at the end. There will be a cost. If you listen to Jesus and follow his way, there's a cost up front. But if you don't listen to Jesus and follow your own way, there will be a cost at the end of that. So, with that in mind, here we go. The first one, guilt. What do we, what do, we do with guilt? With guilt, we need to say it with me. Confess. Turn to your neighbor and say it. Confess. Not confess, but just turn to your name and say the word confess, all right? Not just to God, not just to God. It's important. We need to confess to God. It's important because it's a big deal to confess to God. And basically when we confess to God, we're just agreeing with him that we are wrong because he already knows it. It's not like you're going to surprise God and he's going to go, I had no idea you did that. Gabriel, why didn't you tell me? I need notes on this stuff, okay? No, God already knows what we've done. But it's, it's also very, very powerful, the Bible talks about in the book of James, to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you, that you may be what? Healed. That you may be made whole. And so we need to be willing to confess that. And I would say most importantly, confess to the one that you hurt. Confess to the one that you damaged. Confess to the one that you sinned against. And I'm going to tell you right now, it will damage your reputation for a little bit. That's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so vulnerable when I'm up here. I, I like to tell you the things that I do wrong as well as the things I do right. And I got to tell you, when I first started practicing that, when I first started public confession like that, I mean, it was a little bit intense because I thought to myself, some people won't respect me anymore. Some visitors will go, hey, we're not going to go there. That guy's got problems. And I'm like, well, go find that perfect church, okay? Yeah, we all have stuff we deal with. And initially, your reputation may get damaged for a season. But the longer you carry that guilt around, the greater the cost will be. And the greater damage you're going to do to the people around you. And eventually, let's just be honest, eventually, the truth is going to come out anyway. You might as well be the one to bring out the truth. And I've experienced this so many times in ministry. Somebody's mad or somebody's always complaining or causing division in the church. And you know those folks, right? They're always upset about something. They're always mad about something. And then they'll leave, and then I find out down the road, they had this huge secret sin they told nobody about. And it was coming out in all these destructive ways, and all of a sudden it's like, hello, you were dealing with something all along. You were just projecting that on other people. If you're not ready to confess to the one that you hurt, 
Start with a safe friend this week. But eventually you're going to get the strength to get that out and you're going to talk to that person that you're hurt and you're going to deal with that issue. And when you do, can I, can I just let you in on a little secret here? When you do that, there's going to be a level of chaos out here in your life. When you confess that, there's probably going to be a level of chaos that goes on in your world. But there's also going to be a level of peace in here that you can't even begin to explain. And I promise you, if you keep following Christ and keep walking in His love and keep asking Him for strength, eventually all of this chaos out here will calm down. But more importantly, you'll be calm in here. You'll find the health you're looking for, for your heart. We need to confess. For anger, this is a fun one. We need to forgive. We need to forgive. And forgiveness simply means this. I'm going to take, I'm going to identify specifically what someone has taken from me. And then I'm going to set them free saying, you don't owe me anymore. Now there may be a consequence legally. There may be a consequence in the family. There may be a consequence, a natural consequence. There may be a consequence with the law. There may be some, I'm not talking about, you know, the fact you just, you say, I forgive you and they don't have to deal with consequences. But you're setting them free from ever, ever, ever making that right with you again. You're saying, you know what? I'm right with God. I am letting that go. You no longer owe me that debt of what you did in my life. And for some of you are thinking, man, if I do that, if I forgive them for what they did to me, I'm going to be letting them off the hook. Yep. That's why it's so hard to forgive. Because we feel like we're letting them get away with something. We're letting them off. But you'll also be letting somebody else off. You. You'll be setting yourself free from your own prison you've built with your own bitterness. You'll let yourself off as well. Third one, greed. Just give. I mean, give, baby. Just start giving. I mean, you need to write a big-to-you check. Do you know what a big-to-you check is? A big to you check is a check or a gift that is big to you. That would turn your neighbor and go, that was deep. All right? It may not be big to anybody else. It may not be big to your neighbor. It might not be big to anybody else, even in your family. But it's a big deal to you. It's bigger than you thought you would ever do. And maybe for some of you, for some of you started to give and you're being generous here and there. For some of you, it's time that you took the step to the biblical wisdom of tithing. I'm serious. This has set me free in my life. You look at your income and say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take 10% of everything God gives me and I'm giving it away. I'm going to bless other people. I'm going to invest in other people's lives. I am going to give it away. Maybe for some of you who aren't giving at all, you need to start by just looking at your budget. Say, okay, I've got five bucks left at the end of the week. Then you give that five bucks. You give it. You bless somebody with it. And you say, take that greed. Take that scarcity. Take that fear. I'm not going to live with that anymore. I am going to give to deal with greed. How many are excited about that tonight? You want to get real serious? You want to get real serious? Find something precious to you. Not a child, but something precious to you. <laughs> Some of you are like, I got something to give. <laughs> okay, You're getting real serious here for a second. I had to wake you up, all right? Find something precious to you, an object, a thing, okay? Not someone, something, all right? Sell it and give the money away. Give it to somebody else who's been admiring it in your home. You know, they've walked by and said, wow, that is so beautiful. Give it to them. Bless them with it. Set your heart free. Giving sets me free from stuff. And the interesting thing is, it's stuff that doesn't even belong to me to begin with. God owns everything. God gave me everything. The the fact that I can breathe, the fact that I can think, the fact that I can work, He has given me everything. Without Him, I would have nothing. It doesn't belong to me anyway. I'm holding on to stuff that isn't even mine. And the whole time I'm going, mine! And it all belongs to Him. Think about that for a second. The, The irony of the story of Jesus and the religious leaders That they could just dedicate everything they have to God so they wouldn't have to give to anybody else. It's like, it already belongs to God. It's already His. You see, Jesus' followers don't trust in riches. Jesus' followers trust in Him who richly provides everything for our needs. Can I get an amen on that tonight? And sometimes stuff 
gets way too deep in my heart. And I'm not against having stuff. I'm not against collecting stuff. I, I collect some things. I do. I'm just against stuff having me. And that I will not tolerate in my life. Last one. This is a tough one. Jealousy. You know how you deal with jealousy? You celebrate. You celebrate what God has already done in your life. You sit down and you take a ruthless inventory of your life and you thank God for what he has already given to you because it's so easy with all the wants of life to forget all the things that God's already provided. I, I took a day of prayer this week and I went and just, I went walking and just praying and this is one of the first things I did is I just started with a list of all the ways that God has blessed my life already. I have some things I really want God to come through. I have some things I can't wait for God to do. I have some things I would love to see happen and I've been starting to get frustrated. I've become a little bit impatient. Anybody here trying to build a house or do something in construction right now? Anybody? Anybody? Isn't it a blast? Okay. And so we, we have all these things we want to do on our property and we're working with banks and we're really, really close. We're really, really close to announcing some stuff with you guys. But it has taken twice as long as I wanted to take. And my attitude hasn't been the best. And I've had conversations with people. I've been a little testy about it. So I needed a day for Pastor Dan to go get his heart right. And I just started by thanking God for everything that he's already given pure heart. All the blessings that we already have. And then you know what I did? I began to celebrate for some of my friends in ministry who are getting things that I'm waiting for. You want to see your heart get free? You start celebrating other people for what God's already given to them, the things that you want in your life. You thank God for that. You praise God for it. You go, God, I thank you that I thank you that CCV could do all the things they're doing. I thank you. That, I thank you that Central is able to do the things they're able to do. I thank you that Calvary. I thank you Vineyard. I thank you for what these guys and gals are able to do. I thank you for what you're doing in their churches. Can't wait for you to do it in pure heart, but I thank you for the things that are going on. Thank you for their wonderful buildings and all the things that they can do. And I just begin to thank God for all the great things that were happening around the valley here in the lives of churches. And it's hard to set me free. Maybe for you, you got to sit down and write that thank you note to that guy at work that got the promotion you wanted. And you got to sit down. Maybe you just sit down, you get that pen, you get that note out, and you're just like, Dear Frank, Congratulations on the promotion. Even though you're a slacker and a bottom kisser. <laughs> no, you don't put that in there. Dear Frank, I'm congratulations on the promotion. I'm praying for you to succeed. And you just say, take that jealousy. You get that weak stuff out of here. As for me and my heart, we're going to be free from these issues. Can I get an amen from anybody tonight? It's hard. I talk to my kids, which is a good thing to do. I talk to my kids about their feelings all the time. As, as a matter of fact, I probably talk to my kids about their feelings more than they want me to talk to them about their feelings. All right? But I started when they were really young. I, I want to give you some advice. Parents, grandparents, do, do this. We, we used to do what we called happy sads is that you, took, you found three things that made you happy that day and one thing that made you sad. The reason we do three and one is because I wanted them to focus on the good things more than the bad things, but I still wanted them to be able to identify the bad things and be able to articulate it. And so we would do this around the dinner table. We would do this when we were driving in the car. When the kids were little especially, we'd go, okay, okay, happy sads. What were three things? Come on, around the, around the car. Three things that made you happy today. What are three things that happened that made you happy today? They'd tell me these little things. And that was one thing that made you sad today. And we'd pray about that. And I talk to my kids a lot about their heart. Because, you know, I find that we're just not very good at identifying and dealing with and talking about what's going on on the inside. And now that they're teenagers, um, you, you want to know how they respond to me now when I do this? And I go, tell me how you feel. Are you feel mad? Do you feel sad? Do you feel happy? Tell me what you're feeling. You know what they say to me? They go, especially my boys, are like, Father, can we spend another hour on the couch talking about our feelings? <laughs> no, no, they don't. Matter of fact, there's sometimes when I start to do this, they look at me and they go, I'm not mad, I'm not sad, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. My daughter the other day, we were driving to school, and she like, she was just, I mean, I couldn't get her to open up, and she looked at me, she goes, what is with all the questions, Father? <laughs> but over the years, they've been these, there's been these powerful moments when um, they'll just open up. And they'll start talking about what they're feeling. And now as, as, as Josh is 17, he's a senior now, now Josh will actually come to me and he'll, he'll begin to start talking to me about feelings before I start to ask him about feelings. 
There's something that my kids used to say years ago. They don't say it anymore. But there was something they said, and it's kind of a scary thing, and I think it's probably one of the biggest issues in Christianity. I said, tell me what you're feeling, and tell me are you happy, are you sad, tell me what's going on. I want to talk to you about your feelings. I want to talk to you about your heart. And this is what my kids would say to me. This is dumb. You ever heard that from your kids? Anybody? Come on. How many of you raised kids? Seen a kid? (laughs) Stay with me, guys. All right? That's what they say to me, right? This is dumb. And you know what some of you have thought tonight? This is dumb. I don't need to talk about my feelings. Yeah, you do. And it's part of the problem. It's part of why you keep doing the things you said you'd never do saying the things you said you'd never say because you don't want to do the hard work of dealing with your heart. Because the idea of going home and examining your heart, the idea of sitting down with somebody in your life group and talking about what you're feeling inside, that whole process just seems like pain to you. I had a friend of mine tell me the other day, he's wrestling with depression. You know what he said to me? He goes, can I be honest with you, Dan? I go, yeah, be honest. please be honest. He goes, I'm not sure I want to do the hard work of dealing with what's in here. What are people saying when they say that? The pain to change has not outweighed the pain I'm already in. But eventually the pain you're already in will outweigh the pain to change. But can I tell you something very dangerous about that moment? For many of you, you've already experienced way too many consequences and the brokenness is massive. So with that said, can I ask you a question tonight, Pure Heart? Is everything okay with your heart? How are you doing on the inside? What you wrestling with? What you feeling these days? Is there just stuff rumbling around you don't want to talk about? You find yourself saying, man, where did that come from? Why do I keep doing that? Can I tell you something? You're in a safe place. This is a place that honors the heart because your heart was made in the image of God. It's the deepest, most personal part of who you are. It's where life comes from, and joy comes from, and peace originates. And I plead with you to begin the process of being honest about your heart. Start having a conversation with somebody this week about what's going on on the inside. These guys will tell you. They'll tell you that some of the reasons that they ended up in some of the places they've been is because they weren't dealing with what was going on on the inside. But now because they're courageous men filled with God, they're saying, I'm willing to not live that way anymore. I want to change. I want to be different. I want to be whole. I want to be healed. And so I guarantee you, they meet in groups and they talk about what's going on on the inside, don't you guys? Because that's how you find the life, right? So bow your heads with me for just a moment you're here tonight and the big next step for you is for the first time in your life is to be honest with Jesus about your heart and simply just saying Jesus I don't know how to fix my heart but you created it you know so I need to come to you I need to for the first time in my life give my heart to you accept you into my life I need your healing I need your hope maybe maybe for some of you tonight it's not a first time maybe years ago you made that decision you asked Christ to come in man you've been doing your own thing and going your own way and Here you are tonight, listening online, sitting in here, and not by chance. And Jesus said, I just wanted a moment to remind you I'm in love with you, that I'm the great healer of your heart, and invite you, ask you to invite me back into your life. So if that's you, maybe it's for the first time, or maybe tonight's a rededication of your life to Christ. If that's you tonight, what we do right here in this room is we raise our hand. Man, when you raise your hand, you're saying, that's me, and I need Christ tonight. I'm not playing any more games. So if that's you, without hesitation, would you just raise your hand up and say, you know what, I need Christ tonight. Just raise him up across this room. I need Jesus tonight. I need to invite him into my life. I need to give him my heart. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. Keep raising him. I need Christ tonight. All of you with your hands raised, go ahead and put them down right now. Pray this in your heart. God hears you. Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, 
I commit my heart, I commit my life, I commit my way to you. I trust you with my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Oh, I'll just let him know it. Forgive me. Forgive me for holding on to these things. Forgive me for the things I've done. I confess it as wrong. I give it to you right now. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. Just tell him that. Say this, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your presence. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's give God a big hand tonight. Awesome. Well, we're getting ready for our baptisms tonight. We have some great guys from Crossroads who are going to be baptized. And I want to say a couple of things. First of all, if you need prayer for any reason, our prayer team would be flat out honored to pray with you tonight. We're going to gather over here on this side of the baptistry. The prayer team will come down. If you need prayer, please don't leave without being prayed for. Also, if you're a guest, thank you for coming tonight. In your bulletin, you'll find a little tear-off section on the, on the edge there. Fill that out, tear it out, go out to the lobby, go by the information center and say, I want to know more about Pure Heart. I want to know more about where you're going, and we would love to connect with you in a deeper way. And then lastly, you know, those of you who raised your hand tonight, I want you to know if someone doesn't get to you tonight or talk to you tonight, you can go right across the patio and up the stairs to room 522. 522, and it's a safe place that we've created for people just to ask questions. Maybe you didn't raise your hand tonight. But you've got some questions about what it means to follow Christ. You've got some questions about life you've been wrestling with. We would be so honored to sit down and just talk to you in a deep way about what's going on in your life. Give us the privilege of doing that tonight. So, those of you being baptized, would you stand and make your way over here tonight? Give them a big hand. Come on down, guys. Friends and family members, would you join them down here? Come on, gather around the baptistry, and let's celebrate together. All right, here we go.
divine, lost in our sin, you made us alive. How can we ever hold it inside? We can't hold back. And we're gonna live to high, high, our bed is right. High, high, voices you had, make it loud, louder. Never gonna stop. Take somebody to dinner.